Because of Jesus, we are bound. Because of Jesus, we have been given eternal life. Because of Jesus, eternal life is already happening. Because even if we sleep in the ground, we've got the resurrection and we'll continue to live. I invite you to pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, what a, a glorious promise it is that we can have the assurance of eternal life with you. Day by day assurance as we surrender our lives day by day to you. Thank you for your being here already this morning throughout the service and the Sabbath school. And Lord, I just want to invite you to guide my thoughts and use me this morning to speak to all of us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we had the mission project here, changing the carpet and painting the walls, we had Ostop speak that Sabbath and share his testimony. And then he shared a little bit what, how the Lord led him into the ministry, Build and Restore International. And where he got the name of that ministry, from Isaiah 58. And as he was sharing, some thoughts went through my mind. A number of years ago, when we were working, beginning, not beginning, but the process of raising money for the church, this theme, in my mind, I shared that what we're about, building a church and growing a church family, that that was kind of our, our mission at this stage in life. But as Ostop was sharing, I, I thought our mission is not, our, our mission statement as I've defined it is not complete. And sharing with a few others this phrase I'd like to introduce. Sharing Christ's healing love. For why are we building a church? Because Christ's love has impacted us. Christ's love is healing us. And we want to share Christ's love with others. Christ's healing love. How do we grow in, as a, a church family? By experiencing and sharing Christ's healing love. So that, that phrase, a crucial part that needs to be a, a central part of our thinking as we build a church, as we continue to grow a church family, by sharing Christ's healing love. Now that word healing, in the Greek, it comes from the word sozo. Save comes from the word sozo. So when we read in the Bible where Jesus saves, we could also say he's healing. And when we read about how he healed someone, we could say he saved someone. So in, in God's mind, it's all one package. Healing us in every way, physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, relationally. Healing. Saving. Christ healing love. Now we see his power described in the scriptures when he touches someone and they're no longer crippled or they're no longer blind. That's power. But the root of that power and the source of all healing is love. And love is what we lost 
when they ate from the tree called the knowledge of good and evil. They lost love. Leading to brokenness, leading to blame, leading to guilt and shame. And so God, in the plan of salvation, is infusing us through the Jesus, the plan of salvation, and through the Holy Spirit, restoring us by love. Ty Gibson came up with a, a little video that I'm going to share now. And Pastor Darrell, if you could get that ready to go and... Um, introducing how vital love is to every human being. And when you're ready, go ahead. We, human beings, we so don't have a video. Let's... You have to exit out of the PowerPoint. Just exit to the top right. Put the X. obvious, right? So the king took babies from their mothers at birth and placed them in the Is care it? of nurses who were forbidden to speak. I'm going to go back and see if I can help get that people. video up. Love and intimacy are powerful are by the very existence of love and the fact that we need it. Back in the 13th century, the German king Frederick II conducted a diabolical experiment intended to discover what language children would speak if never spoken to. He had a hunch it would be German. Some things are just obvious, right? So the king took babies from their mothers at birth and placed them in the care of nurses who were forbidden to speak in their hearing. But there was a second rule that was imposed as well. The nurses were forbidden to even touch the infants. To his great dismay, Frederick's experiment was cut short, not before, however, something tragically significant was revealed regarding human nature. As you may have guessed already, the babies grew up to speak no language at all because they died. In the year 1248, an Italian historian named Salimbini recorded with an the air of scientific observation. They I don't know if you caught that little experiment. What would happen if babies were not spoken to? Would they be able to speak at all? Would they speak German? Because that's what they, the country they were living in. They didn't speak German. And they were also forbidden to be touched and they died. Today, doctors refer to that as failing to thrive. Without love, we will not thrive and we will even die. Love is the heart of God. It's the heart of the universe and God is restoring love into the hearts of people. 
In Isaiah 55, 6, kind of a little background leading up to Isaiah 58. This call, this message, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. He is near now. He is near everybody, but not everybody calls upon him. He's knocking, but not everybody opens the door. He's waiting to bring healing to each of our lives. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and you have no money. Come, buy, and eat. Without money or without price, come, buy, and eat. Why do you spend money for what is not bread for your, or your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to, to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight in abundance. Now our tendency is to think all this is just physical food. But Jesus, when he knocks on the door of our hearts in Revelation 3, he says, if you open the door, I will sup with you and you with me. And we will fellowship together. The spiritual food that he wants to give us. The truth that he wants to, to, to use to transform us. Is the food that he wants to give. Delight yourself in abundance. It's without money, without price. We come to us to him just as we are. And he has already freely given the food that he wants us to eat. The Bible Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Many people not satisfied. A hunger in their hearts. Looking for happiness. Looking for hope. Looking for meaning. Will spend money on lots and lots of things. Thinking this will give me happiness. Sports. Entertainment. Someone will think... Oh, if I can only find a person who will love me, then I'll be happy. And they look for a person and spend money trying to, to get someone to love them. But without love from God, that person can never satisfy the deeper longing. People spend their money on drugs, on alcohol, trying to fill that longing. Binging on food, trying to fill that longing. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? The longing is out there. This week, a couple of ladies came in looking for lodging for a night. Been homeless for much more than a night. And so we, I called around looking for is, answers of what we can do to provide something long term that can bring healing, that can bring help. Didn't find anything yesterday as far as that would work for last night. But Monday, hoping that they'll be going to Walla Walla. There's a, a couple places there that, that would fit for them. Uh, last evening, I, I called one of them up and asked how they're doing. Met them at a place, gave them a supper. Neither of them being raised in a church. Sometimes we think of mission field being across the ocean. But more and more the mission field is here where people have very little knowledge of who Jesus really is. And as Judy was praying, praying for this dear friend. 
And Wednesday, God meets them. Judy connects to show love. As we pray for people that we love, pray also, Lord, how do you want me to show that love? Can you put ideas into my mind of how to show that love? Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Abundantly pardon. No matter what we have done. Isaiah 56. My house should be called a house of prayer for all nations. This was right there in Isaiah. When Jesus comes, the Jews just seem to, to miss that passage. And we want to not miss that passage and recognize no matter who we meet, God is there for that person. God loves that person. 57. Isaiah 57. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. We call that heaven, a place we want to go. But I also dwell with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. The word contrite literally means crushed, broken. Jesus refers to that, the first beatitude, blessed are the broken in spirit, the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven because I'm earning it for them. I dwell with the contrite, the crushed, the broken, those who recognize I need help. I can't do it on my own. I'm helpless. God says, I will help. To revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. 57 verses 18 and 19, I have seen his ways and will heal him. Peace, peace to him who is far off and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. How does he do it? Through his love. A love that leads him to come and die for the sins of the world. And we've been given the ministry of sharing that love, of sharing the reconciliation. Last week, the favorite story I heard at camp meeting. You may have heard it. You may not have. I'll share it here. There was a seminary professor who, him and his wife, were on a vacation in the hills of Kentucky, I mean, to Tennessee. And, and as they were there, they, they wanted just some time together and some quiet time. And they went to a restaurant and this elderly gentleman comes over and begins to talk. And uh, the professor is actually wanting to not really get into a long con conversation. And so he, he just has curt, short answers. But then he asks, what do you do? I'm a seminary teacher. Oh, you're a seminary teacher. You teach preachers how to preach. Yes, I guess you could say that. Well, I've got a story for you. And he pulls up a chair. And he begins to tell the story. I was born to a mother who was not married. I didn't know my father. And we moved to this back hills 
area. In fact, if you look out the window, the base of those hills, that's where we moved to. And everywhere I went, people would say, who's your father? Who's your daddy? I didn't know. I didn't know. And I get made fun of, ridiculed. But one day I, I went to a church and I heard the preacher sharing some stories. And they were interesting stories, but I, I, after it was over, I'd run out because I didn't want anybody talking to me, ridiculing me. One day, I didn't get out fast enough. And someone put their hands on my shoulder, and, and I turned around, and, and here was the preacher. And he said, who, who are you, son? Who, who's your daddy? And I was scared. I didn't say anything. Who's your daddy? Oh, I know who he is. I, I can see it. You resemble him. God is your daddy. God is your daddy. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. You're a child of God. He left that place with that realization. Began to think about the value that he has in God's eyes. He's a child of God. His attitude changed. His outlook changed. Ben Hooper grew up, became the governor of Tennessee two terms. As that evening program was coming down in my security jacket last week, security, I started telling people, remember, you're a child of God. You're a child of God. We are children of God. God so loved the world. We're his children. And he's doing anything and everything necessary to restore the relationship so that we want to be with him throughout eternity. I will heal him. How? Through his love. Heal, to make whole, is really the, the root meaning of that Hebrew word, to make whole. What does wholeness look like? The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Wholeness is experiencing peace. Peace with God. Peace with ourselves. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from shame. Secure in Christ. Wholeness includes emotional health. Being able to relate to others in, in healthy ways. Looking out for others' needs even more than our own. Wholeness includes physical health so that we may have the energy, the thought process, the strength to share and to love. Isaiah 58. Shout. With the voice of a trumpet blast, shout aloud, don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. 
And you think, as we, as we flow through from Isaiah 55, 56, 57, tell my people their sins. How is that love? In the New Testament, the same message is the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. Do you know why? The very next phrase. Because they do not, what? No. Convict the world of sin. Because they do not believe in me. It's not convict the world of sin because they've transgressed the law. That is sin. But why? They do not believe in me, and their unbelief leads them down a path of pain and suffering and hurt. Convict them of their need that they might be open to want to know me, the one who heals with his healing love. Israel, this is God's people. They act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. Going through the forms, but living out a life contrary to God's love. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. The Hebrew word fast literally means to cover the mouth. You wonder how the word fast relates to that. Uh, the background of that, it comes from uh, the idea of hold fast, hold firm. Phrases like fast asleep or steadfast or to fasten something to the wall, to hold firm. That kind of meaning of fast. In religious terms, going for a period of time without eating is one of the more common forms of practicing restraint or abs abstinence. That is likely how the word became associated with food. If you think about it, to fast, even in modern usage, is basically to hold firm against temptations of food or to be immovable in your resolve. So hold firm or fasten something to a wall. It's going to be held firm there. So when you fast, you're holding firm to your decision to stay away from. During the spring of the year, during the Lenten season, many people will, will fast from something, will, will stay away from something for a period of time. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with fasting uh, from something for a period of time. But oftentimes it's something that's, that's not good for you to begin with. And my thought is, well, if it's not good for me to begin with, make it a lifestyle fast. Just kind of stay away from it. Always. You fast. You. But the impression is 
they're stopping this, they're stopping this, they're stopping that. Okay, God, isn't, aren't you proud of me? God says, no, I'm not. Because there's more to Christian living than simply what we don't do. The Seventh Day Adventist Church is one of the smaller congregate, smaller kind of groups in the United States. Not everyone knows about Seventh Day Adventists, but but if they've heard about some Seventh Day Adventists, oftentimes they think, "Aren't they the people who?" And what are some things that you think of that? What's that? They don't. They don't eat pork. They, they legalists. Uh, they. They don't do any work on Sabbath, on Saturday. They don't, okay. Uh, anything else? They don't, yes. They, they might be associated with that cult, like in Waco. Uh, they have hospitals and universities. So some of the positive things, some of the, don't drink, don't smoke. If all people knew us by is by what we don't do, that's very similar to what's happening here in Isaiah 58. We don't do this, we don't do that. God says, that's not what I'm after. What I'm after is something much, much more. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly in prison. That's the New Living Translation. Um, the the King, named, King James, uh, wickedly enslaved. And so that could be two different meanings. So here, unjustly imprisoned, putting people in prison that, you know, to who they're not, the one who did the crime, that would be not a good thing. But also could talk about spiritual enslavement. Free people enslaved or imprisoned, spiritually or even physically. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Not making it overbearing for them so you can have, a, have it easy. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. And I th as I read these verses, I think about Jesus, and that's what he did. He went about freeing people from guilt, freeing people from shame. The woman at the well was ashamed for her lifestyle. Jesus loves her, shows her that she's valuable. And it's like her shame disappears and she goes about and tells everyone about this man who knows all about her but still cares, talks with her, treating her as valuable, as a child of God. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. The healing love of Christ. 
is what the world needs. And it will take everything we've got. And God knows that. And that's why he says, I will be with you. I will help you. Then you will call. The Lord will answer. Yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness. The darkness around you will be as bright as noon. When this becomes our focus of sharing Christ's healing love in many and various ways, in ways that the Holy Spirit alone can lead us and empower us and and guide us into, the light of Jesus will shine brightly. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. There's no question. It is hard, time-consuming work in trying to share Christ's healing love with people, with an enemy called Satan, trying to do everything he can to block that. Jesus says, I'll keep restoring you. I'll keep helping you. I will bring life-giving waters that will flow through you. In John 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and we see it all around us. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And and it's our tendency to think of that abundant life as, as more goods, so that we have it good. But Jesus sees abundant life as more giving, more loving, more sharing. That's abundant life that leads to more people experiencing healing. That's rich. When people experience healing. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities and then you'll be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. Bringing people together is the healing love of Christ. And may we dedicate our lives and our work as a church to that. Let's sing our closing song. It's entitled, We Are His Love. We Are His Love. It's going to be on the screen. I'd like to invite you to sing, uh, stand together as we sing.
dear Father in heaven, we have been blessed by your love. And we're blessed by the fact that that love will never fail. That your love will continue to restore us day by day. Lord, the mission that you've called us to is an undying, self-sacrificing ministry. A ministry that, from a human standpoint, seems hopeless. Seems worthless because the hold that Satan has on people seems so strong. But Lord, in your strength, in your empowerment, by your love, you are able to break the bonds that have slaved people and set people free. And we want to dedicate our lives and our church to that ministry. It's not about us. It's not about our strength, our power. Our, it's about you. And may your Holy Spirit fill us that we might be an expression of your healing love. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.